James Mather, sound supervisor for Kenneth Branagh's new film, Belfast. Uh, James, obviously a very uh, personal project for Kenneth. I know in so much of it feels like an active memory that he's pulling from, I guess. I, what were your initial conversations like with him about how the film should sound, you know, based on like, I'm sure he had a lot of thoughts about how, you know, about how it would sound because it's coming from such a personal place. So I guess like, what were those conversations like initially? Uh, they were very, um, he was, he had some very strong ideas of memories that he, that he perceived with sound. And when he wrote the script, he included a lot of those in there. Um, and one of the, one of the, I mean, we've done about five or six films with him, maybe more. And one of the things that um, we enjoy so much about working with Ken is that he he's very keen for you to bring to the show your own ideas and your own um, perceptions of, of, of what you see. So quite often we'll watch the movie in silence just to get a notion of the rhythm and the and the kind of uh, the visual impact without any uh, without any extra impetus. And so we or influence. And so we. Um, the first thing we did is we went through and we did a, a, a sketch of what we thought it should be, how it should sound, um, playing on the period of time and, and everything else. And then and then we spent a good few hours going through with Ken and just um, pushing and pulling ideas and then investing in other notions that he felt might be interesting to emphasize the point of view from Buddy, uh, the child actor in the film, uh, the child character in the film. And from that point on, we worked closely together pretty much all the way through. We'd see him. We were in lockdown, of course. So, so you know, it wasn't full lockdown. We could work in bubbles. But it meant for us, we had a lot of access to Ken and he to us. And we'd spend a lot of time together throughout the whole process. Um, and all the way through the mix, he was with us all day, every day, um, which is really rare. I can't think of the last time I worked in a production where we had so much input from the filmmaker and the you know, and the and the the person whose story this was that, that it was such a personal project. Um, so it was kind of unique in that way. I mean, we know him very well. We know what he likes about a soundtrack. He likes clarity. He likes the dialogues to 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 really. You know, he doesn't like an audience to have to work to understand what's being said. Um, and in his words, he felt this. That he he always perceives the sound post sound process as another go at the script, as another opportunity to put another draft of the script together because it allows him to consider additional lines that might work from crowd artists around the location, um, just to emphasize the moment and what is going on. Um, and knowing that from working with him, we kind of had a lot of that in mind as we started, but it grew, it grew like all these um, productions grow from the, from the first seed of, um, the first sounds that were put in, we would, there's a lot of work that the editor did, but most of it was predominantly the music tracks that were added and where they wanted to have music. Hmm. And uh, in, a, in a very beautiful way for us, as the soundtrack built, um, music diminished in a lot of places. So we, we started with a heavier track count than we ended up with, which is, I, I always find is a, uh, a good sign because it gives you the confidence that the soundtrack we're creating is is working in conjunction with the music and not having to be led by the music. If you know what I mean? Yeah, you meant. Can you talk a little about like? Obviously, I, I was going to ask you about that because it does feel like so much of the film. Obviously, the film is from Buddy's perspective, but I feel like so much of the the sound is too. And I I, I don't know how else to like. It just seems like it. It's like a couldn't even you know what I mean it's like an unperceptible thing that I'm like oh it is seemingly sound like it's from like a child might hear it or like you know what I mean like yeah. from how loud a lot of the breaking glasses and like the unrest scenes or like even like the initial explosion in that opening scene is so it really shakes you like out of your seat I, can you t was that this kind of stuff you talked with Ken about or yeah you know like what were yeah. specifics he, absolutely he very much wanted to strike a, 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 a peak in contrast between the happy-go-lucky playing in the streets, innocence of childhood, um, uh, community combined, you know, a community connected um, through people and, and trust. And he wanted that to be smashed because that was his memory. It was like childhood was over when the riots started. And, and he talks about, uh, he couldn't quite understand what this noise was. There was a blur at the end of the street and it, 
and he couldn't, he thought it was bees. He wasn't sure, it, it, it didn't make sense to him. There were bees near where he lived, near the park. And so the moment it explodes, all those sort of perceptions are shattered into the reality of, of, of the hard bricks and glass and, and brutality and violence and edge. And um, this was, a, this in fact, was one of the first instances where we had a music track running through the riot. It kind of built up as the camera rotates around Buddy and then went into this, into this very dynamic track. It was a Van Morrison track, I believe. Um, and strangely, the track gave an energy to the riot, which made it slightly less um, aggressive and, and less dangerous. It, it, allowed you to, it allowed you to bounce along with the track rather than feeling like you were immersed in this chaos. Um, and so we worked hard to make the sound effects work in time with the music and pitch bangs and clangs so that they didn't, they weren't too ugly with the track. And then when we took the music away, it was like taking the scaffold away. We were left with this um, suspension of sound effects, which all had a rhythm to them. And they also had tonality to them. Stones hitting the, the, the dustbin lid shield that she was using, the mother, mother was using. Um, and it allowed us to then pile in a little more, but more, more than that, it allowed us to pile in some really aggressive shouts and instructions from the rioters and abuse hurled through to families in their houses as they were trying to escape. And that rhythm of a shout, a window smash, a shout, a gutter smash, you know, and all that stuff. And it, and it suddenly made it incredibly visceral and incredibly um, urgent and terrifying and that was very much what he wanted and I, I think the whole process for him as we were as we were developing this was him kind of em embracing what he had remembered to being a reality if you know what I mean the memory of something is always you imagine it's it's one thing and then you remember it going going back to it and thinking actually no you're right it was a lot more aggressive it was a lot more violent it was a lot more terrifying I've sanitized it in my years of sort of filtering it um, so, so there was a there was a there was an opportunity at the beginning to really set the tone for the film. Helicopters, newsreaders on the TV, shouting from the rioters, shouting from the neighbours to each other as he walks. The day after the riot, he walks down the street, and you hear neighbours calling out to each other, building the barricade and fixing the windows. And it, it just really helped put you in the boy's situation that he is surrounded by this this world of uh, his community. I, one minute it's like I said, you know, full of joy, and the next minute it's full of action, and they're getting each other ready for battle and protecting their 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 residents. Um, and the, the, that carried through the whole film. There are places where we've used sound in a much more impactful way, particularly in the cinema clips where he's watching a movie clip, and and the sound we we augmented in a big way to give it the full immersive Atmos experience. A lot of the soundtrack is pretty LCR, pretty up the front only with a little bit of detail for helicopters and what have you around you. But when you kick into the, to the impact of the cinema, he wanted that to be as he remembered it being on him. This, this big thing that was overwhelming and that's slightly sort of awe inspiring. Um, and so we did that wherever there was an opportunity you know, making voices seemingly bigger and more cavernous and more threatening. Authority had a had a reverb on it, wherever it may be, whether it's in the living room or the church or the, you know, the ceremony. So there was there were there were techniques that one wouldn't normally use um, to emphasize Buddy's perspective. Ken and Simon, the dialogue editor and co-supervisor with me on this, worked very well together because Ken's such a um, fastidious and uh, he loves dialogue and he loves to make sure that every nuance and phrase and consonant is clear um and there were some lovely moments where we're locked on buddy while he's listening to his parents talking and we're just on buddy for the whole piece and we you know simon sort of decided let's try pulling the dialogues off the screen a bit let's move them around just enough so that you you feel like you're hearing it from Buddy's seating place. Um, and it was great fun. You know, there's a lot of things that you wouldn't do normally uh, because 
it, it sometimes it'll throw you out more often than not those kind of techniques will throw you out of the moment but in this case it actually kept you locked in with buddy um and and some things you didn't need to hear you didn't need to understand like the tv stuff chattering away in the background and that was a deliberate ploy to get you to stay with buddy who's playing with his toys in the foreground we're seeing we're hearing the world as he heard it there's stuff going on but his parents are talking or whatever but we're with him and it's his perception mm -hmm. yeah it's, it's really incredible and it creates such an evocative i think feeling and sense of place and time and james mather sound supervisor for kenneth brown as well fast we have to wrap up here but thank you so much it's great hearing you talking about the film thank you